Thank you all for coming back in. So uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about security issues, foreign policy issues, uh, US-Ukrainian issues, I hope. Uh, my name is Michael McFall. I am a professor here at Stanford. I'm also the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. Um, uh, and a Hoover Fellow, if, in case you're interested. I don't know why you would be, but I, I'm all those things, and I'm glad to be uh, part of this panel. Um, we are going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, we've already heard from our two MPs a couple of times, so we're going to give you guys a break for a minute, just for one minute. Um, and then we're going to start with Mike, uh, Dr. Carpenter to you, uh, and then we'll end with Ambassador Pfeiffer to you as well. He, he kind of threw that in. Oh, when I was working in Kiev, uh, he was our former ambassador in Kiev, just to make clear. Uh, but let's start with Mike first, Dr. Michael Carpenter, who today is the senior director of the, the, ben, the Penn Biden Center. But I want to make clear that you're speaking on your own capacity right. here and not representing uh, right. the, the presidential candidate. Um, uh, just so we're clear as we're live streaming this is, uh, uh, to the world. Uh, uh, Mike is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and, as I said, senior director for Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he was in the government for many years. Thank you for your service. Uh, first at the State Department, then moved over to uh, director in the Russian, uh, uh, director for Russia, right? Yes. Um, under Celeste. Uh, under Alice and Celeste. After Alice, Alice and Celeste, yes. in a job I used to have. Uh, and then went on to work for the Vice President, and then was, his last job was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for, for Defense, responsible for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, Balkans, and conventional arms control. I didn't know that last one. Um, and I would just say, follow Dr. Carpenter on Twitter. Uh, he has some of the most interesting, profound things to say about Ukraine, uh, and actually on everything, but especially Ukraine. You've got to be following him if you're interested in these issues. So. Dr. Carpenter. Great. And he's a Stanford grad, by the way. Yes. I want to claim him. <laughs> uh, as is Ambassador Piper. So we got three Stanford graduates up here. So great. Well, uh, first of all, thanks to Professor Fukuyama and to you for inviting me. It's absolutely wonderful to be back. Um, on the topic of security and defense issues in Ukraine, I think we are in a very, very precarious moment right now. We've seen already. Putin test President-elect Zelensky with this policy of passportization, giving passports to the Russian-occupied parts of the Donbas. This is exactly what Russia did in the run-up to the war in August of 2008 in Georgia. Of course, then in Georgia, this was a pretext for invading, invoking the rights of uh, Russian passport holders, Russian citizens living in Georgia uh, as a pretext to go in and invade. Now, of course, Russia has already invaded Ukraine. So you can ask yourself, well, well, what really is Putin up to? And what I think he's doing, besides just a provocative move to sort of claim these residents as Russian citizens, I think this could possibly be a predicate for at some point in the future potentially recognizing the independence of this occupied territory. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but clearly Putin is telegraphing to the brand new novice president-elect of Ukraine, look, I've got a lot of options here, and I think a lot of people maybe in this room have heard of the union state scenario for 2024, where President Putin is looking for a legalistic way to potentially extend his reign uh, in Russia and could potentially create a new union state of Russian Belarus in order to run as president of that new union state. Well, that union state could include not just Russian Belarus, it could include potentially Eastern Ukraine and Abkhazia and South Ossetia. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I have heard from reliable sources in Moscow that this is an option that's being discussed. So a lot of pressure now on President-elect Zelensky. Uh, the land war, of course, in the Donbass continues each and every day. Artillery fire, uh, Russian reconnaissance operations. There was recently a, a sabotage operation that was uncovered by the SBU uh, and foiled, luckily. But the Russians keep poking and testing. And then in the Sea of Azov, the, what I call the policy of creeping annexation continues. 
harassment of naval traffic through the Kerch Strait uh, from uh, Ukraine's Azov Sea littoral from Mariupol and Berdyansk into international markets that uh, not, not perhaps as, as, as height, heightened as it has been in the past, but still occurring. Um, and then another, a number of other moves to sort of to test uh, the mettle of this new president. One thing that you all should be, who follow Ukraine, should be watching out for is uh, at the end of this year, the, uh, the contract between Naftahaz and Gazprom expires on December 31st of this year. And at the same time, we see that construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and the Turk Stream pipeline in the Black Sea is continuing apace. So this as well puts enormous, enormous pressure on the new president-elect to either cut a deal with Russia for potentially favorable gas prices and a, and a transit contract, or face an end of the year where you have no throughput through Ukraine at all, potentially all transit could be stopped, and therefore giving Russia enormous leverage. And those who think that, well, Russia wouldn't do this because you know, it needs to supply its European customers, well, you know, um, with Nord Stream 2 coming online, potentially in uh, early next year, and Turk Stream, this is now a more viable option. So that is, that is something to watch out for. Uh, I, I think the challenges are enormous. Uh, it's gonna be uh, very important for Zelensky to appoint an experienced team. Uh, it was mentioned in the last panel that the prosecutor general, the head of the SBU are gonna be among the early appointments, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Defense uh, also fall under the president's purview. And who he decides to appoint to those key positions is gonna say a lot about uh, how experienced the team is and also what the foreign policy orientation uh, of the new president will be. I, uh, I wrote recently in the Washington Post uh, an op-ed where I argued this is the moment where the United States should be engaging with President-elect Zelensky, with his team, trying to shape his opinions, shape his view of the diplomacy, uh, the Minsk Group diplomacy, but also the broader diplomacy uh, in terms of putting pressure on Russia, um, shaping his views on the anti-corruption fight, on economic reform, offering him support, not just assistance, but strategic advice and support, um, and then also communicating red lines. What, what, in our view, are things that were, if, for example, Privat Bank. If Privat Bank is um, uh, denationalized, if you will, um, that for us is a big deal. We, the US government was very supportive of the nationalization of Privat Bank. Uh, so I think it's incumbent to, to engage now. And unfortunately, sadly, uh, this administration is doing the exact wrong thing right now by recalling our very experienced three-time ambassador in Kyiv right now uh, without a successor who has been named to succeed her um, and um, without any sort of senior engagement in, in Kyiv. So uh, it's a very fraught moment. I'm afraid that we're uh, either sitting on our hands or for various political intrigues at home, we're not engaged and, uh, and that's not a good combination. So uh, I will stop there and then we can, we can oh, I, I, well, actually there's one other thing that I wanted to say. Another reason why this is a very fraught moment uh, right now. This is the tail end of the Poroshenko administration. I have congratulated President Poroshenko on a very gracious concession speech. I think that the transition uh, is going to be peaceful and smooth, but there is a but here. Um, I was very alarmed with uh, the president's appointment of 75 Supreme Court judges recently, 15 of whom did not meet the, did not get uh, a nod of approval from the Public Integrity Council. That's a bad sign to be doing that on your way out the door. And uh, without going into details, I will say that I have heard credible reports that potentially some senior members of the management boards of state-owned enterprises could be replaced in the coming weeks as a sort of final move. Um, and I think that would be a disastrous thing to do. Um, and the United States should be telegraphing that to the outgoing administration. Now is not the time to make personnel changes, to leave, to saddle your incumbent with your people. Now is the time 
to gracefully hand over power from one administration to the next. Great, I want to circle back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Several things we'll circle back to, but let's get everybody in with their initial comments. Uh, Hannah Hopko's already been introduced, I think, twice already. So, um, but for live stream, just to remind you, she's a member of parliament. And for our purposes, uh, one of her many things that she has done has been the head of the Foreign Affairs, is the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in the RADA. And I just want to say, I've, I see you perform around the world uh, at various events. And no matter what your political persuasion inside Ukraine, I think all Ukrainians should be incredibly proud of the way you represent your country abroad. And I just want to take my, that moment to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <sighs> so because it's for Ukrainian culture to, to express gratitude, it's something that we are just learning. <laughs> and especially Ukrainian citizens, they, unfortunately, they, um, there is an information campaign to create a desacralization of power. When people hate parliament, uh, government, uh, uh, president, and others, and you're living in the environment with everybody just criticizing, everybody just demanding extra information about your private life. And if you uh, show the fact that you conducted like 1,500 protocol meetings within these uh, four and a half years, traveled to more than 70 countries and others, they don't care. They say, no, you, need, you have to do more because it's not something. So this is why I'm a little bit <laughs> impressed. And, uh, but uh, coming back to the um, very important uh, topic. And uh, thank you everybody for helping Ukraine within this uh, almost six years of uh, facing Russian aggression and for being with us. Because Ukraine on its own could not survive and to be successful in countering Russian aggression. So without the strong coalition of Western partners, of course, uh, uh, Putin could probably reach deeper, uh, grabbing more territories. And I think we learn a lot together how to prevent uh, some of the um, escalations. But um, what to add, what uh, Mike Carpenter just said. Um, for me, it's very clear about the Putin's plan. He is unstoppable until we stop him. Uh, if you read an uh, article written by Mr. Surkov, uh, was published this February, uh, in Russian language, it's Dolga Gosudarstva Putina. Uh, it's like long state of Mr. Putin. You will see the clear plan. What is in Putin's regime mind? So he is just explaining that they build the foundation for further like uh, um, extension of Russian sphere of influence. Besides Syria, besides the Western Balkans, besides Venezuela, there are many other places where Putin will be happy to interfere in the domestic policy and others. So uh, besides Mr. Surko, who is as a one of the advisor of Mr. Putin, focusing on more hybrid tactics, using uh, propaganda, using uh, information and others, there is another guy, Mr. Uh, the General Gerasimov. He has, uh, not Artur Gerasimov. <laughs> Okay, just just the, the the different, it's a different family. Yes. The different one. Okay. So uh, if you read Gerasimov view and advices to Mr. Putin, who is responsible for militarization and actually the Wagner group in Syria and uh, ideas in uh, Venezuela and others, so this combination of strong uh, military presence with hybrid uh, tactics. This is a super tool for Russians to um, extend their power. And of course, uh, you mentioned passportization. We would like to see more tougher reaction, but not just by statements, but real sanctions to be imposed after this uh, Putin's decree on passportization. The same what we've seen after Azov, uh, see events um, and the open aggressive uh, act of aggression in November uh, 25th uh, of last year. So actually it took us more than two months to uh, have a, 
individual sanctions on behalf of the EU on eight individuals, uh, uh, Russian uh, Navy milita uh, some mil um, military guys, but not the leadership. So I think uh, with Russians it's very clear what is their strategy. But uh, if you ask me, is it clear what is the West strategy towards Russia? So don't be diplomatic. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so it's really hard to answer, and we are leaving. No, okay, sanctions. But sanctions. This is not the strategy. Sanctions are the instrument, and we are very thankful because compared to Georgia, for last five years, we are having these uh, sanctions. But it's not uh, preventing subversive act of Russians in other territories. I think Nord Stream Two, uh, Mike mentioned. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is an existential threat for Ukraine. And it's not just about economy, that we will lose 3 billion per year annually. It's more than we are receiving from IMF right now. It's about our leverage. We have for last more than 53 years that Ukraine proved that we are a reliable partner to transport gas through our territory to European Union. So if Russia finish uh, building Nord Stream 2 by passing Ukraine, so there is no uh, interest for European Union, for some countries, to continue sanctions because there is no pragmatic interest because they will have Opal, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, Turkish Stream, uh, TANAP, Transcaspian uh, and others. So there is no reason to support Ukraine. And some countries who are now advocating for weakening or lifting sanctions within the EU, and let's wait and see the results of European <laughs> Parliament elections also. So I think without a uh, strong position uh, with, uh, on Nord Stream 2, uh, this will be hard for us to stop export of corruption from Russia to European Union, because Nord Stream 2, it's not about energy supply. It's about Gazprom monopoly and the dominance po uh, position of Russian Federation at the EU energy market. And uh, Ukraine received javelins. This is a good uh, and very positive uh, support uh, we uh, expected for this. But we now expect to see the new javelins. This is the American sanctions against the European companies which are involved in building Nord Stream 2. Because uh, the GATSA legislation, which was adopted in uh, Congress uh, in 2017, countering American adversaries through sanctions, this is good, but this is uh, not enough. We need to see a real sanctions in place, especially against the Swiss company, which has unique technology, how to build uh, the pipeline under the water. So uh, I think uh, we have to be more realistic on what Russia is doing and more consolidated in responding and more pro proactive in preventing some of the steps. Because sometimes it's more expensive to uh, solve the problem instead of prevent uh, this uh, situation. Uh, with the new elect President uh, Zelensky, uh, I do believe that uh, Vice President Pence or the State Secretary will visit inauguration ceremony. Because for us, uh, uh, we stick to the principle, nothing to, uh, about Ukraine without Ukraine. And uh, on May 14, State Secretary Pompeo will have the meeting with uh, Mr. Putin in Sochi, at the territory of Russian Federation. But there is no news that before or after he will visit Ukraine. Or when Mr. Uh, Trump had the phone conversation with Mr. Putin, around 90 minutes. So, of course, Ukraine was mentioned during the phone conversation. And I think this will be very um, good to have like a, um, another phone conversation with current president, Poroshenko, just updating what was still his uh, president running until the inauguration. So I think this, um, uh, when we are talking about strategic partnership, it's important to be, to keep, um, to update us on the situation and not to allow some rumors or some uh, informations that Russian uh, source of media are trying to disseminate. So I think we have also 
uh, to cut these opportunities for Russian propaganda to um, undermine our partnership or the trust between the strategic uh, partners. And I will not uh, provide you with the information about the numbers of uh, Russian uh, military groups that are at the temporary occupied territories, like 35,000 of strong military group in the occupied uh, Donbass, 87,000 military armed with over 900 tanks, 2,300 armament combat vehicles, about 1,400 multiplied launch rocket system, and 500 aircraft and 300 helicopters. It's the, now it's the Ukraine-Russian border. 70% of the Ukraine-Russian border is occupied with heavy military presence uh, from Russian side. If you ask why Putin is doing this, just for uh, sticking for the Minsk agreement uh, as a peaceful settlement on the conflict? No, I don't believe in this. And I was the one who supported in 2015 the Minsk agreement obligation when Ukraine proved that we are a reliable partner, when we voted uh, in the first reading the constitutional amendments. And I truly believe at that time that if Ukraine make uh, this step, this provide the extra opportunity for our Western partners to increase pressure on Russia and to see the ceasefire. Then withdrawal of heavy artillery, exchange of hostages, and all the package. Now it's 2019. We are not talking about the ceasefire. We are talking about new uh, open act of aggression from Russian side. And we are fighting to release our sailors, 24 uh, brave sailors. And we are discussing uh, and reading the Moscow uh, Times about that Putin is ready to give up uh, if the price is uh, correct for him. G give up Venezuela for the uh, right price for him. What could be the right price for him if he's ready to give up Venezuela? So I think it's important for the West because uh, for next 18 months with the current uh, administra Trump administration, it's important for Ukraine first to save bipartisan support in the Congress. Uh, it's crucially important and uh, also to keep the solidarity, transatlantic solidarity between the EU and the United States. Because another tactics of Russia to split the US and uh, European Union and within the European Union and uh, Nord Stream 2, it's also another project um, just to divide the European Union. And uh, of course, uh, uh, besides, uh, 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 military support. I think we, we, sh we should uh, think, uh, seek uh, more investment from European and American companies in Ukrainian economy, and it's also our uh, ob obligation to finish judiciary reform, because uh, the new investment into Ukraine, it's another way of protection to receive political protection from uh, government of uh, the United States and the European Union. And um, uh, I hope that uh, the Ukraine Reform Conference uh, in uh, Toronto this July, which is set up for uh, July 1st, uh, two, uh, second, uh, first, um, or two uh, uh, of July, and new elect president Zelensky, together with the Prime Minister Grossman and MPs, they will be in Toronto. And this is a good opportunity to discuss uh, with different uh, international partners, allies, uh, about the priorities of uh, cooperation with Ukraine. Then in the middle of July, there will be Ukraine-EU summit uh, in Kyiv. I think this is another uh, opportunity uh, to develop the agenda of uh, uh, our bilateral uh, with the EU uh, cooperation. And the more support, assistance, advisors will be now with the new elect president from your side, the less uh, attempts from pro-Russian forces to um, fulfill this vacuum or this uh, uncompetency, uh, the less chances for pro-Russian or uh, and others. So I think if everybody applauds Ukrainian uh, elections as a free and fair, and as the election which were for the last decades the, the most democratic at the European continent, this is good. This is the privilege of mature democracy that Ukraine became, but it's also a huge responsibility for us and for you. 
uh, because uh, to protect this democracy by providing extra uh, military support, new trainings, and also I hope, and I'll do my best in the parliament to adopt the law on reforming state security service, reform national uh, intelligence service, uh, and I already submitted with another MPs the law on establishment, the parliamentary oversight committee over defense and security. This is crucially important, and I hope with the new elect president, we will adopt this legislative package before the NATO summit in London this December. And I also hope the doors uh, for NATO membership perspective should be open for Ukraine. You should in, uh, put conditionalities, but if you try to close or like to show that if, because we already discussed with the EU, uh, the, in their uh, 10 years of Eastern Partnership uh, declaration, they just uh, skip uh, EU aspiration, membership aspirations from for Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. So I think it's really important to keep the doors open because this is the motivation for political class and also motivation for civil society to perform better and one day uh, to become uh, uh, a strong partner. And even now, from within five years from the victim of Russian aggression, we became a, a contributor of European security. And also this is your investment or your support. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Artur Garasimov. Uh, he's already been introduced uh, from the previous panel, but for our purposes, he's not only the head of the Petro Poroshenko bloc, but he's also a uh, the chair of the permanent delegation of the RADA uh, to the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, and he's also a member of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security and Defense. So, Artur, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And Starting to speak about security issues in Ukraine, first of all, I want to remind that uh, what we passed in 2014. Uh, during 2015, 16, 17, I met with many MPs from Europe, from United States, and uh, many of them told, guys, it's, it's a miracle how you survived. Because at the same time, you received military aggression, you received economical aggression, you were just two steps from the financial disaster, and this is on the energy uh, aggression, how you survived. And it's, it's a real miracle. But uh, the biggest danger now in Ukraine that we still, unfortunately, didn't pass, didn't pass the non-return point. Yeah, we did a huge change, huge change. We are now on track, we are continuing our movement, but we did not pass the non-return point. And what happened, we already can see in some other countries how they are moving their directions from the European, from the NATO direction to other, let's say, points uh, and places in the world. So the second one, uh, I strongly believe that at the moment in Ukraine, uh, maybe not under question, but there is the fight for the, not only for Ukraine, but for Western values and principles, and if Russia will win in this battle. It will not be all, not only the lost for Ukraine, it will be lost for all Western world. And at the moment, Ukrainian army is fighting with full support of our American partners, Canadian partners, European partners. But uh, if it will be lost, believe me, Russia will not stop. Why I, I strongly believe in that? Because chain didn't start in Ukraine. Remember, Chechnya, no prompt reaction from the revolt. Okay, next point, Transnistria, no prompt reaction. After invasion to Georgia, no prompt reaction. Jackpot, why not to do? They went to Ukraine. And if now, if now, country aggression will not be stopped in Ukraine, believe us, it's just a question of time where they will make the next blow. I can tell you a very small story. Uh, I'm recently in politics, uh, but recently, four years already. Uh, in, in the end of 2014, uh, I became uh, a member of the parliament. And uh, during January, February 2015, I visited my first uh, conference in the OSCE as a head of the delegation. And immediately I spoke with many colleagues and peers from European parliaments and told them, guys, please uh, listen to me. 
now make the full database of all media, of uh, all experts, of all, uh, you know, uh, res res how to say it, respected NGOs who now blame in Ukraine. Because I think Russians' hands already inside that stuff. And just in one day, just by one click, all these media, NGO, you know, experts can turn against your own governments and your own countries. In January 2015, 100% of them told me, Artur, come on, freedom of media, we have, you know, all democracies, it's not possible in our countries. Two years passed. In 2017, in the end, the same people came to me and told, how did you know? Because exactly these media experts and Jews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, switched against government in the, these European countries. So that's why, why we are knowing that. Because Russia is using Ukraine now as a training field. Just one example. On the occupied Donbass, they are using top secret weaponry and equipment, which is even not provided to the Russian army, I mean, uh, common army units. It just produced, just tested, and they are sending it to Donbass to test how it works. And it's not mentioned not only by our intelligence, it's already many times mentioned by SMM of OSCE. And thank you very much for Special Monitoring Mission for their great job. And uh, next point, um, hybrid war. <laughs> already Mr. Gerasil was mentioned. I can tell you one thing, his work uh, how to tell it? Uh, the price of the science is forecasting, yes, something like that. The value, the value of science, the value of science is, is predicted or forecasted. I have his work on the table every day because in this work, many years before the aggression to Ukraine, they step by step mentioned what does it mean hybrid aggression? And military aggression is just the last step. The first one is economical, political, informational, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be very careful and please very carefully analyze what happened in Ukraine, especially during the last six months. Because uh, the question is, did Russians influence uh, the elections in Ukraine? Yes, of course, hugely. And please analyze these six months by seconds, by seconds. And suddenly you will find many interesting facts which will explain you some things which are before were not explainable. Uh, next point, carriage trade situation. For me, it's not understandable because international law was broken. Ukrainian military ships were attacked in the international waters. International waters, those of you who is aware about uh, sea law, it, it's crazy. What we see, guys, no reaction. For me, it's no reaction. And uh, just for information of our American colleagues, I think it's a bit similar to the situation in some uh, South China Sea. Yeah, please analyze it, and you will find many similarities. And if, if you will allow Russians to go out of this situation, please wait. Please wait. But it will be very dangerous. Uh, next point. Uh, we were telling during the previous sessions about uh, how to solve situation in Donbass, what to do with the people. But you know, the question now, we kindly, and also was great question about what Trump administration can do. I can tell you, UN mission to Donbass, UN mission to Donbass. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. But even technical evaluating mission still didn't send to Donbass. You know, you understand that before to send mission, UN need to send technical evaluation mission with purpose to evaluate all the things and to uh, understand the situation. Even this step was not done. So this is the solution. And I kindly ask our American colleagues to push as much as possible this because I think this is the only way at the moment to make this really hot situation because every day, almost every day, they are killing our people, not only soldiers, but civilians. On, this is the only way to stop the situation. And the last but not least, uh, you know, uh, the, our panel is security and foreign policy in Ukraine. And now, yes, we have many challenges because we are now in the uh, period of transferring power from current president Petro Poroshenko to president-elect. But the key point to keep 
direction towards NATO, European Union, and let's say bigger uh, view to the Western values. That's the key point. And I will kindly ask our Western colleagues to do as much as possible to educate new team, to help new team, you know, to keep this direction. And uh, from our side, what I want to tell that we are ready to organize full support of new team related to keeping direction towards NATO, towards European Union, towards Western values. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, in our cleanup position, we have Ambassador Pfeiffer. Um, he already introduced himself as the, uh, the Perry Fellow at CSEC. He also uh, runs our European Security Initiative here at FSI. So if you're interested in these issues broadly, sign up for future events. Uh, he did serve for a quarter century uh, in our US government. And I want to, no, I want to <laughs> applaud that. I want to applaud that. Um, uh, uh, and just thank you for your service. He did many jobs in addition to being ambassador to Ukraine, including deputy assistant secretary for the region in 2000, what was it, Steve? 2001 yeah, to 2004. And I he, had your job and Mike's job. And I was just going to say, uh, we all <laughs> also all served at the National Security Council at various times uh, for various bosses at various levels. Um, uh, I never was in charge of Ukraine. I want to point that out. Um, and it was a sore spot for me, but never mind. <laughs> we'll talk about that uh, later. Ambassador Pfeiffer. Let's I'm, I'm not sure though what message it would have sent had the senior director for Russia been in charge of Ukraine. Understood. Uh, I mean, Understood. one of the things I had to deal with in the 90s uh, from yes. the Ukrainian American community was this idea of we have to separate Ukraine out from Russia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Okay. None well, of us are in the government now, though. But anyway. right, yes. Actually, I'm going to ask you a question about the current government in a minute. But okay. say your remarks. Yeah. And I'll come yeah. Back well, I've back. been sort of scratching things out as they've been said by the three, three previous panels. So yeah. just a few comments. Um, first of all, um, in terms of Ukraine's relations with the West, you know, I think that European Union Ukraine summit in July is really important uh, because. While defending itself against Russian aggression, I think Ukraine can still develop and deepen those links with European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. And it seems to me that in the case of Ukraine and the European Union, you have the roadmap, the association agreement. I, at about eight years ago, I was at a conference in Krakow on a panel like this with a foreign minister from a Central European state. And we got talking about the association agreement. He says, if Ukraine fulfills the association agreement, it will be more ready to join the European Union than my country was when it joined in 2004. So you have the roadmap. You know, the first question is, do the homework. The second thing I think Ukraine needs to worry about is, how do you grow the economy? Because within the European Union, you've got every year x billion euros that are designed for development funds. Now they're going to southern European economies and central European economies. And I think when EU members look at Ukraine, at the Kurds here, they kind of say, my god, it's going to be a sponge soaking all that money up. So the, the, the faster you can grow the economy, that strengthens your case. And the third question, and perhaps the hardest question, though, is you know, how do you deal with some EU member states who at the end of the day are going to say, yes, but Russia doesn't like this? You know, you've got to figure out, and, and, and that, that's a challenge. Uh, on the NATO side, uh, I very much hope that in December when there's a NATO summit, uh, there, there should be a NATO-Ukraine summit in parallel with that. that. That would be an important signal, and that's an easy thing for NATO to do. Uh, sorry? We just need to, to work with Hungary to unblock the situation. We need to find a way that, yeah, no. At some point, someone needs to explain to Hungary that there are certain bilateral issues that you do not bring into NATO. And uh, I would hope that uh, the American government, the president will have an opportunity to convey that to Mr. Orban directly next week. I'm not sure if he will or not, but he does have the opportunity. Um, but again, I, I, I th also though, with regards to NATO, though, um, don't push for a membership action plan by name because that's too hard. But what you can do is you can take the contents of a membership action plan and just call it an action plan. Uh, avoid the, the there will be a fight over the title. NATO doesn't seem to fight over the content. But then, then do the homework. And, and then there is the hard question, which I, I don't have a good answer to. But for a lot of NATO countries, they say, OK, with Crimea, an occupied portion of Donbass, and then illegally the next Crimea, how do you bring Ukraine in without dealing with Article 5? Does that mean we have an immediate Article 5 contingency? 
and, and that's a tough question. But you still can push for NATO to keep the door open and to intensify and deepen cooperation. I mean, that's it. doing things at this point is in Ukraine's interest. And I think you can do a lot of things that you know, prepare the way so if that opportunity opens up, Ukraine will be ready. Um, on Donbass, uh, Michael, you're talking about recognition. That, that's an interesting point. Although, if Russia recognizes the DNR and the LNR, the so-called People's Republics, as independent states, to some extent, Russia then owns them. And, and, and I'm just wondering whether the Russians then are prepared to face the economic consequences of that, or are they just prepared to let these two little statelets uh, live in poverty for forever? Uh, I, I'd still believe that there's a chance to persuade Russia to settle in Donbass. And I think it makes sense, for example, to keep thinking in the ideas, or keep one of the ideas about a United Nations peacekeeping force, and an accompanying interim um, international administration to handle the civilian aspects. Because that is, at, at, at some point, if Vladimir Putin comes to the conclusion that Donbass is not worth it, you know, that's his face-saving way out. And so I think that, that that's an important thing to keep going. And then the West needs to find a way to maintain and strengthen sanctions. And here I'm kind of of two minds when I look at Europe. Uh, on the one hand, um, in 2014, if you had told me that the EU would be where they are today with regards to sanctions on Russia, I would have said, wow, that's pretty impressive. I, I don't think people would have predicted that. And I think Chancellor Merkel deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, but by the same token, you know, what we need to do is we need to find a way to get both in Washington and in Europe an escalation of those sanctions. Because it's about changing the calculation in the Kremlin, the cost-benefit calculation. We want to drive the costs up so that Mr. Putin gets up tomorrow and says, it's time to get out of Donbass. Uh, but that's going to be a tough sell. But I do agree with you. I mean, I thought the Western response to what happened in the Kurdish Strait in November was absolutely pathetic. Uh, and it's a response that I think you're right. The US Navy may someday come to regret, because we've sent a bad signal that's going to be seen by other players around the world. Uh, but on sanctions, on, Hannah, on your point on Nord Stream 2, uh, I hope we can find a way to stop Nord Stream 2. It is a political project. It's not an econ it, it makes no commercial sense. Uh, I'm a little bit leery, though, about talking about American sanctions on European companies, because I think then what we take is a problem between the West and Russia, and we make it an internal fight between the United States and Europe. And that may undo our ability to maintain solidarity on sanctions. So I, I think we have to be careful how we think through that particular route. Um, I guess the last comment I would make is, yeah, I, I was very concerned about what Mr. Bolton said about Venezuela. It's in our sphere of influence. That is absolutely the wrong talking point to be using now. Uh, but I do think that there is sufficient support for Ukraine. Uh, you see it in the Congress. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, and I think within the US government, those who work on Ukraine you know, understand the importance of Ukraine and Ukraine's success for the kind of the Europe that the United States would like to see. Uh, and so I, I hope that resists you know, any wild ideas that may be ginned up in the White House. And then I guess my final point is, uh, might agree completely with what you said. You know, this is really a key moment in Ukraine with a new president coming on board. It's absolutely the wrong time for us not to have an ambassador there. And it means forfeiting an opportunity to influence a presidency in its early days in ways I think that we would like to shape it in terms of pushing it towards a Ukraine that uh, answers US interest. Uh, but I don't know how we solve that problem. <laughs> So I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then by 3.15, we'll open it up to everybody. Uh, I want to dig a little deeper, first in Ukraine and then in the US government, uh, about uh, foreign policy attitudes, right? So we've been talking very generally, you should do this, you should do that. Ukraine thinks this, the United States thinks this. But we heard in other panels about the importance of leadership and how people matter. First, to our Ukrainian colleagues, could you give, especially for those of us who didn't follow the election as closely as you did, what are our clues about President-elect Zelensky's ideas about foreign policy? Uh, I know foreign policy is generally not a, a major issue in, in American elections, 
Uh, is it, was it a bigger thing? Do we have any clue? Could you code us? Is he a realist? Is he a liberal? Is he a westernizer? I mean, what have you, anything you could tell us, clues we learned, or is it a completely blank slate? That's the first question. Second, is there any indication to Mike's point about who might be appointed to some of these key positions yet, or is that also completely mysterious? And then to my American friends, uh, it's the same question, but in reverse. Um, Ambassador Pfeiffer said some very reassuring things about the US government, uh, otherwise known to the president as the deep state. Um, um, <laughs> but I want to get into that with a little more fidelity, because uh, there was a time, and I've been on TV many times, praising the Trump administration's policy towards Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I, let, I say there's continuity. Uh, with, uh, between Obama and Trump, which the Obama people hate and the Trump people hate, because the Trump people say, we're way tougher than Obama was, and the Obama people say, we're way tougher than Trump was. But let's get into the details a little bit. So we've mentioned javelins, and I think, you know, to their credit, uh, the Trump administration did that, the Obama administration didn't. But where are we now? H.R. McMaster's not at the National Security Council, he's over at the Hoover Institution. Uh, Secretary Mattis, same thing. He's showing up here next week, I think. Uh, those are two gentlemen who I know well that had pretty firm views on Ukraine. I'm not sure I know who, what the, you know, the, the, uh, our new uh, secretary designate uh, for defense, what he thinks about Ukraine. I, I don't know what Mr. Uh, Bolton thinks, and, and I get very nervous about references to privileged spheres of influence because that is a trade I can easily see President Trump taking. So get, tell us who is, you know, you, we keep mentioning the Congress. That's great. Who in the U.S. government today is, is holding on and pushing the right policy towards Ukraine? We don't have an assistant secretary for Europe, but unless I'm mistaken, I'm not in Washington anymore. Uh, so who is that person? In your administration, after I'd left, as somebody said earlier, we knew exactly who those people were. By the way, you were one of them. Uh, um, who are they? Uh, Ambassador Volker, what is his mandate? He was appointed by, by he, he doesn't have a paid job, as I, if I'm not mistaken. He was appointed by the previous Secretary of State. What authority does he have when it comes to Ukraine policy? If you guys could just dig in a little bit deeper uh, who's actually in charge of Ukraine policy. But first to President-elect Zelensky and what are his views on foreign policy generally and especially towards the United States? First of all, uh, the foreign policy direction of Mr. Zelensky and uh, who will be responsible for foreign policy in Mr. Zelensky, let's say administration and uh, will be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it's a big secret or nobody knows. At so the we moment. don't know? Don't know. Okay. Uh, That's yeah. not a good thing. Just that, yeah. that right? uh, no. There are many not good things now in Ukraine. a little Ukraine. bit more this late in the game. Uh, anyway, okay. Second point. Uh, <laughs> yes, many people from his team told about different things, but you know, uh, in the morning, one people from his team tell in one direction, in the evening, another guy from his team tell in another direction. So, for me, we already received two small, but I think very important uh, signs from personally Mr. Zelensky. First of all, he told about direction towards European Union, personally told. That's very, very good, and it was very nice to listen personally from Mr. Zelensky. And the second one, uh, his reaction towards Mr. Putin's decision about passports. Yes. It was really very nice to listen that uh, at least we have direct reaction from Mr. Zelensky, and we have this, his direct speech. Of course, we will wait for the steps, because, you know, uh, always, uh, Messaging need to be supported by steps, but at least now we have ah, a direct messaging. That's already great success. And uh, the second one, we have the direction towards you and towards against uh, country aggressor. Great. Helen, you want to add anything? I just wanted also to add and just uh, find this reaction on Mr. Zelensky that uh, the only common. Uh, uh, I thought for a long time about the lots in common between Ukraine and Russia. The reality is that today after the annexation of Crimea and aggression in the Donbass, the only thing remaining in common is the state border. So this was the reaction of Mr. Zelensky uh, with the clear position that uh, we are not one nation as Putin uh, usually like to say about yeah. Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, also, um, he, during the debates uh, which happened at the 
stadium uh, mentioned that NATO will be the priority. And I hope that all the meetings he has um, almost every day. Just recently, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Christian Freeland, uh, yeah, had yeah. a meeting with him. The, the European uh, Commissioner uh, Han also had a meeting with him. Um, um, President Macron before the election, and uh, so we expect uh, expect to see uh, um, higher level uh, VIP visitors to the inaugurations, like presidents of different countries. Uh, so we hope that all these meetings, this is um, extra uh, investment to fix his foreign policy priorities. And uh, I think the key for Zelensky is to continue uh, the foreign policy which uh, was uh, uh, started from 2013 when Ukrainians rejected to become a part of Euro-Asian uh, empire or custom uh, right. Russian economic uh, bloc and decided that uh, we want to be the part of European family. So this is because this was the decision of the whole nation and uh, Zelensky could neglect Poroshenko's achievements, but it's about the people's choice. This is something that we, he could not ignore, and he will stick uh, with the parliamentary uh, uh, cooperation and uh, constitutional changes uh, about NATO and the EU. So I think um, he will have to focus. <coughs> Plus, uh, the high level of support among citizens of NATO and the EU, this is another uh, instrument of uh, framing his uh, his work, and I heard um, several names, and even some um, interviews with some candidates uh, for uh, minister foreign of foreign affairs position. Is that one of them you? Uh, no. Uh, yes, I'm <laughs> chairing the committee on foreign affairs. <laughs> so, but um, uh, I was uh, publicly mentioned that uh, in the committee on foreign affairs we are ready to meet with him team with his team working on uh, foreign policy to discuss the priorities. That's great. And uh, actually, I know several people working with him on foreign policy, and also World Congress of Ukrainians already started to prepare the roadmap of the cooperation with him, which included also foreign policy. So I think um, in uh, this situation, we have to equip him and to support with uh, advices and others. And uh, this is what is Great. in the process, and this is also what President Poroshenko mentioned, that he is ready to uh, update him on, on the details and like secret information on all negotiations in Minsk, right. Normandy format, and others, this readiness uh, uh, in place. And um, I think from the first appointments, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Defense, it will be very clear. <laughs> the signal, yeah. The signal, the signal, so, uh, so uh, let's see. Mike, if you were, well, your op-ed was great, by the way, about what needs to be done, and it made me think who would operationalize your op-ed right the, now. The people, I think, in this administration who cared about Ukraine are gone. Uh, Jim Mattis and Wes Mitchell um, and H.R. McMaster, and, and they're now gone, and you have some people within the bureaucracy, within the State Department, within the Defense Department, within USAID, who care about Ukraine, but who have no real authority to push any kind of policy on Ukraine. And so as a result, and they're very wary of the Trump inner circle within the West Wing, which seems to have no strategic interest in Ukraine uh, as a foreign policy issue, but has a, have a lot of interest in using Ukraine as a political partisan football to advance various conspiracy theories and other things. So early in the administration, you had this crazy peace plan floated by Andriy Artemenko, which somehow wound up with Michael Cohen and then on the desk of Michael Flynn as he was about to be uh, fired, um, that was basically a big leaf for lifting sanctions on Russia, which indicates very much that this administration, at least the inner circle around Trump, sees Ukraine entirely through the lens of Russia and how do we improve our relationship with Russia? How do we get back on track so that we can cooperate on whatever it is that they want to cooperate on? Um, but, um, uh, but now we've moved past that and now we're sort of, uh, now there's this, you know, uh, people can read the latest article in the New York Times today. I'm gonna get but, to that, that's okay, my last well, question. Okay, well, yeah. I'll save it, but, but, uh, but, but using Ukraine essentially as a 
partisan, as part of this partisan game to blame Democrats for, I guess, the investigation of Paul Manafort. I don't even know what they're trying to blame Democrats for specifically, uh, but they feel burned, I think, that, that Manafort uh, suffered consequences for his corruption in Ukraine. Uh, but no strategic view. Kurt, look, Kurt Volker, I, I consider him a friend. I think he's a strategic thinker. I worked with him when I was a professional diplomat in the, in the uh, George W. Bush administration. Um, but he, you know, his mandate is the Minsk process. Right. It was the negotiations with everything. Surkov, which right. are now on ice. And he, and you know, he's not there uh, talking to Zelensky about his team and, and you know what our red lines are and none of that. So uh, we have an acting assistant secretary, Phil Reeker, who's competent, but I don't think he's particularly a specialist on, on Ukraine. Uh, and so the policy is kind of, it's in this vacuum, unfortunately. I don't know if Steve Do you want to add anything, thought. Steve? Actually, just uh, slightly different. I mean, I, first of all, I, I would agree, I think, with uh, Mike, your opening observation is, I look at the actual policy as opposed to wherever the president's head may be on this. And it really is a continuation of what you saw in the last couple of years of the Obama administration. So as much as President Trump claims credit for the increase in NATO defense spending, that actually began back in 2015. Uh, and, okay, okay, Go ahead, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think, again, the, the policy so far as regards Ukraine, as regards U Russia, as regards NATO, has actually been pretty good with the asterisk that I don't know what the president's tweet tomorrow is going to say and it could launch in a totally different direction. Now, I think part of well, the reason- let's, let's be clear. You yeah. would, I don't want to yeah. put words in your yeah. mouth. I would say, with the exception of one person, uh, there's no evidence that the president supports the policy. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to put yeah, words in yeah. your mouth. Those are my words. Yeah. I'm no. glad you agree. Yeah. No. I, I mean, there's a policy, but uh, yeah. You I, just I, never I, showed there, any. There, there's nothing to suggest that the pre president instinctively supports this policy. Right. Yeah. At uh, least not zone, yet. He would go in a very different direction. But here's where I think, um, you know, one of the faults of the Trump administration is the failure to put people into position. So if you look at a State Department organizational diagram, you've got all these actings. And in a way, I think that's good for the policy because the actings usually tend to be career people. And, you know, I was part of the, I, I, I reject the term deep state, but the bureaucracy has a certain amount of inertia to it. And if you have a policy that you're pursuing under the Obama administration, and you don't have somebody directly by you saying, we're going to change the policy in a different direction, the inertia is to continue. Interesting. And you can contra contrast this, for example, with arms control, where you've got very different people now as Assistant Secretary of State for arms control verification and compliance. You've got a different person in the Undersecretary's position. You have very different people at the uh, Defense Department on these issues. And you know how I, th I would argue a very different approach to arms control than you had under the Obama administration. That ha you haven't seen the insertion of those people on Ukraine. And, and so when you go at the level of, you know, our level, I mean, senior director of the uh, NSC, uh, you know, Fiona Hill understands Russia and Ukraine very, very well. I, you know, she's very competent on these questions. And uh, uh, Kurt Volker, you've got Phil Reeker, who interestingly, before he came to this job, was, uh, was the political advisor to the commander of U.S. forces in Europe from, I think, 2014 to 2017. So he has a pretty inter interesting perspective on Russia. He, I don't think he served in Russia, in Moscow. But he, he, he's got a view of Russia, I think. And then George Kent uh, as the DAS. Uh, but you know, it's, what we don't have and, and is we don't have a Vice President Biden. Or in the Clinton administration, it was Vice President Gore. And I would argue in the first uh, term of the Bush administration, it was probably a Deputy Secretary Armitage. Somebody with that kind of senior level who could go to Kiev and say, I'm going to go there. I'm going to have a, a couple of hours to talk to the president and everybody I need to talk to and would carry the weight that a deputy assistant secretary may not be able to carry. I mean, I think that's the missing piece in our approach. You wanted to jump yeah, in on two. Just real quick on this. So I think your last point is the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. The, the biggest difference is that in the last administration, we had Vice President Biden, uh, but we also had Toria Newland and Jeff Pyatt, who spoke on behalf of Biden and Obama, yeah. who were, you know, for lack of a better word, we were constantly in the faces of yeah. You know, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, then Groisman Poroshenko, saying, you know, hey, look, guys, you know, you're doing okay, but you're you're really hamstringing this bill here. You want our support? You got to move forward. And, and you know, providing that sort of very active conditionality and engagement, sure. to say, you know, this your choice, your sovereign country, but you want, you know, you want our support. You got to do X, Y, Z. Otherwise, we're not with you. And and that's missing now entirely. I mean, you, it, Masha Ivanovich is very competent, but she can't. 
you know, unless she's got the backing of those senior people, she can't go in there and make those same claims. You have to have a voice in Washington right. at a senior level to back you up in the field to give your, your message that extra oomph. Yeah. So uh, you've been very patient. So I, should I ask about Giuliani or not? Anybody interested? Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, because I want to answer that question. All right, well, it, unfortunately, Ukraine's on page one of the New York Times today. Uh, maybe it's in other papers I saw in the New York Times. Uh, Mike, you already alluded to it. Why don't our American colleagues try to explain what, he's, what we're doing politically? And then I'm interested, after they've done that, if our Ukrainian colleagues could respond with what's the proper way to deal with a mission like he's going to do. But you wanted to jump in, so no, no, please I, explain I, it, because it's kind of complicated no, and convoluted. No, I think it's actually pretty easy to understand. Okay. You have, in Ukraine, Yuri Lutsenko, who is a prosecutor general who I think most people felt was not doing his job. He was not being sufficiently tough in fighting corruption. And the American ambassador, rightfully so in my view, criticized you know, his office for not doing what it should have been doing. He didn't like that. He was very unhappy about that. So you had Mr. Lutsenko there. You then have Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, who is desperately looking for anything he can find to distract public attention from the fact that the Russians intervened dramatically in our election to get Donald Trump elected president. Uh, he wants to distract from you know, the fact that, what, 750 prosecutors now, or former prosecutors now say, in fact, they would have charged the president with obstruction of justice. He's looking to throw smoke in him. Giuliani, Lutsenko, this is a marriage made in heaven. Uh, I think it was consummated in, what, January or February when they met several times in New York. This is a political play that, that is useful for both of them politically. And unfortunately, and what is the play? Just explain it to people. Uh, I think, I think, I think the, the play is, I think, I think Giuliani wants to sort of create this image somehow that Ukraine, well, you know, weighed in, uh, was that, that went after Manafort, that it was an operation to support, you know, Clinton. Secretary Clinton. Okay. And, and that's how you, well, you know, the Russians were doing it, but yeah, but the Ukrainians were doing it just as well. And look, you know, in our, and you had, actually people had to go to jail because of the Ukrainians. And it just creates a lot of dust and things. And I think because of Lutsenko's unhappiness about being, as I said, rightfully criticized by the American ambassador, um, you know, Lutsenko is perfectly prepared to play along. Do you want to add to that, or should we ask our no, colleagues for how to do it? So what is to be done in Ukraine when Mr. Giuliani shows up? Uh, you know, uh, I think he'll be going after Sergei Leshenko, by the way. That's yeah, part of the story. Yeah, because Mr. Leshenko, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, started all that stuff yes. several years ago with this uh, Manafort issue. But uh, uh, the answer, for example, from our political forces is very, very clear. We are really in fight with Russia. That's why we drastically need bipartisan support from the United States. That's why we will do whatever we can with purpose to keep this bipartisan support. Can I ask okay. you to propose to do this? <laughs> The, 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 pro the problem, I mean, the, 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 yeah. I agree. I have, I have. the jeopardy for Ukraine here is, you know, is that Mr. Giuliani is going to try to pull Ukraine into an intensely political debate in the United States. And it's hard for me to see how Ukraine wins in that. There are only possible losses as far as I can tell. Uh, the, the key issue that, for example, personally, I didn't read this article, and I can't say, about Mr. Giuliani visit, uh, okay, again. From our political party, I can tell you, in the parliament, we will do whatever we can to keep bipartisan support. Bipartisan support. That's the clear answer from my point of view. If you want to find something else, deeper or some black cat in the black room, maybe there is no black cat in the black room. How do, do you want to add anything or? No. OK. <laughs> uh, the floor is open. And if you could just, as we've been doing earlier, if you could just uh, introduce yourself and then ask a question, that would be great. Back here first. Uh, actually, I had a chance to uh, speak before in a uh, previous panel. My question is about Crimea, sure. Uh, as you know that um, we have this status quo that Crimea is Ukraine uh, of like for five years. But the uh, situation has dramatically changed for that last uh, five years. And I think that in international community and even Ukrainians do not understand what's really going on. And I'm not even telling about re replacement of population. I mentioned that before in previous panel. I also 
uh, want to ask you about militarization of peninsula because uh, Russian strategy in Crimea uh, is uh, to build a new military base and I think it can be a factor of destabilization not only in Ukraine because you know that Russia uses these forces in the eastern part of Ukraine, both military forces and people, but also in all uh, Chernomor region. So what should be a strategy, new strategy uh, on that issue that what Russia does already? Thank you. Small add into the question. Russia openly told, Russian officials openly told that they fully restored nuclear weapon facilities, former Soviet Union, for uh, nuclear weapon facilities in Crimea. If Russia is not going to use nuclear weapon in Crimea, the question is very, very simple. Why? They fully restored nuclear weapon facilities from Soviet Union in the occupied Crimea. So this is a small addition. Thank you. component and there's a military component and then there's maybe some others as well in an informational component on the on the diplomatic side I think we have to ha adopt the sort of Wellis declaration type of strategy where we declare this as part of Ukraine and are willing to wait as long as it takes for Crimea to come back to Ukraine diplomatically in terms of formally how we recognize it uh, I think we also have to shine a light on the incredible human rights abuses particularly with respect to the Crimean Tatar community but not just in terms of repression of individuals who dare to speak out against the acting authorities there. So, uh, you know, that's in the sort of diplomatic informational space. On the military side, I'm concerned very much that uh, I see the Russians, the Russian intelligence services, primarily GRU, poking around to the north of the Crimean Peninsula to look for weaknesses within the Ukrainian population. And I've spoken about this before, particularly in the southern part of Kherson uh, Oblast, where uh, Crimean uh, broadcast television towers are able to reach the, the local population there. There's, the narrative is your, your life is, is, is bad, the economic situation is dire, uh, you know, until you accommodate with Russia, things are not gonna get better, the central government in Kyiv doesn't care about you. And they're spreading that message, and because the conditions are in fact dire economically, uh, I worry that Russia sort of, as we say, softening up the population for a potential limited incursion there. There is this canal that runs fresh water from the Dnieper River to Crimea, and Crimean agriculture very much uh, relies on uh, that fresh water for their agricultural production. I think Russia might try and seize that as a small, strategic, victorious little objective war um, to both uh, uh, provide the peninsula with water, but then also to show that, that they can act with impunity and they can take further military steps. So I think protecting that region from a sort of a, a socio-political uh, perspective with you know, USAID type of programs to help provide for economic development, but then also militarily by stationing troops and forces there uh, to watch what the Russians are doing, but also have a tripwire force in place are very important steps that need to happen. I know some of that is already happening, but I think it's not enough. Uh, because I think this is a very serious vulnerability that Ukraine faces. Um, Anna? Uh, I would like to add because um, I think besides what was uh, uh, by Michael just said, I think um, uh, and would like to argue with you, Steve, about the NATO summit in December that Ukraine should not dare, dare to ask about membership action, pl action plan uh, because we have uh, conflict with Russia and situation with Crimea and others. I think this is Russian expectations to have this war in Donbass and occupied Crimea just as another, um, we are in the Capcan, uh, in the trap. We are in the trap. Uh, as long as we have the conflict, uh, this means that the doors for NATO and uh, EU will be closed. This is why I think uh, let's avoid the mistakes were made before with the uh, action membership uh, plan because I think uh, that uh, because membership action plan, it's not like tomorrow we are in NATO. Look at the Macedonia example and uh, we hope that Macedonia will become uh, the 30 country of uh, joining to the NATO. So actually I think that the more we received like uh, membership action plan from the West, this is the, your response to Russian aggression and showing look, 
uh, you are continuing militarization, nuclearization of Crimea, but in return, we provide in Ukraine as in like a next uh, step uh, uh, task to, to reach this. Visa free, uh, that's in comparison, visa free um, regime we received from uh, European Union. We met 144 uh, criteria. So this was a homework in, which included electronic declaration. It was very hard to push parliament, especially those in peace who were not ready to submit electronic declarations, but visa-free regime was at stake. This is what people demand. And if now you say, okay, Ukraine have uh, the conflict, this is the reason why we cannot uh, propose a membership action plan. So this is a, a part of hybrid uh, Russian, you will follow the um, Russian uh, hybrid strategy. And also I could say is that last year, Ukraine unfortunately didn't receive the enhanced opportunity program because of Hungary and another uh, countries which were blocked it, but Finland, Georgia received enhanced opportunity program two years ago. So we are not, if, if, if we're not talking about membership action plan, let's talk about enhanced opportunity program. This December, next year, depending on the situation and our progress about the membership action plan. In 1952, when both uh, simultaneously, Turkey and Greece became the member of NATO, they had territorial conflicts. They had even some uh, tensions for many years before. But the reason of uh, NATO, to make them members of, just to stop. Also, let's talk about uh, Northern Macedonia or another uh, members of NATO within last 15 years, if you analyze. And let's compare with the Ukrainian army. Ukraine every year spends 5% of GDP on security and defense. Now we have one of the most strong army at the European continent. So I think NATO should consider Ukraine as a contributor, as a strong partner, not just a victim of Russian aggression. And because I think this is uh, crucially important for Ukrainian soldiers, for Ukrainian society, and for um, uh, civil society to push government, parliament, and president to implement new legislation just to meet uh, everything which is written in membership action plan as a new priority. I agree with you regarding the association agreement, but association agreement, it's obligation from both sides, not just from Ukrainian side. This is because when often we hear from European Union that Ukraine should implement this, this, Nord Stream 2, it's against the association agreement, Article 274. So this is why we have to, uh, if we can, uh, are strategic partners with the EU and also with other, uh, like uh, in NATO, with the US, I think, uh, especially with the new elect president, uh, you should raise the expectations and uh, propose more, because if you uh, limit the expectation, this will be used by uh, some of the people say, okay, they are not waiting us in NATO. Let's forget about this and try to reverse uh, the politics. No, this is one of the strategy how to return yeah, Crimea yeah. But without yeah. uh, continuous suing Russia yeah. at the UN Court of Justice, yeah. uh, keeping yeah. sanctions, uh, uh, making yeah. Ukrainian yeah. army but strong and others. Great, but great. this is another way how we are uh, making closer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but two points. Now. First of all, to establish my credentials, in February of 2008, I testified to Congress that Ukraine merited a membership action plan. Now, let me also say, having said all that, and I think all your points are right in one sense, in diplomacy we often say, don't ask the question unless you know you're gonna get the right answer. And right now, I think if Ukraine says they want a membership action plan, Hungary's gonna oppose, Germany and France opposed in Bucharest. Um, in 2008. What about the United States? What would you that, that's that's the problem. problem. I mean, that, no, no. It, I, 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 the United, I actually think in Bucharest, there could have been a yes to the membership action plan had the US government engaged in January of 2008. But the Bush administration was silent in January, February, March, and then President Bush arrived in Bucharest thinking at the dinner he's gonna persuade NATO allies. And I remember talking to one ally, uh, or official of an allied country which opposed MAP, and he said, you know, Washington was quiet for three months 
after President Yushchenko said, we want a map. And we assumed Washington didn't care. And then he blows into town and tries to sell us it wasn't going to work. And the problem I think you have now is I don't see in Washington the leadership that's prepared to seize this issue and push it forward. So I very much worry if, if Ukraine makes this a priority, no, you're going to be dis- program. <laughs> okay, but the, the, maybe that, but, 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 the, but the membership action plan, if you push for that, I think it's a defeat for Ukraine if you ask for it and then it doesn't happen. Okay. Not only for Ukraine, by the way. Yeah. Let's uh, take a few more questions uh, up front first and then over here, sir. You're, you'll be the, the, right after her, okay? Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. This has been an extremely interesting discussion. Uh, we basically see three elements. We see an extremely weak president-elect who has not even has a candidate for the foreign minister. We see the United States trying to use the conflict between the, the prosecutor general's office, Giuliani's upcoming uh, visit in the domestic political situation in the United States, and we see the aggressor state, which is always ready to attack. If I may draw uh, Ambassador McFall into this discussion and to ask him to abandon his role as a moderator for a few minutes. Um, if you were asked to talk about the worst case scenario that can happen to Ukraine under these circumstances, A, B, and C, knowing President Putin and seeing him personally and probably knowing what he thinks and what are his longer term goals, what should we expect? What is the worst thing that can happen to us under these circumstances? Do you want me to answer that? Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> Well, I'll be brief. Yes, I know Putin rather well. I wouldn't say we're Facebook friends. Um, uh, I shouldn't joke about that. He's trying to arrest me, and he's banned me from Russia. But, um, uh, but I have spent a lot of time with him, and I, I think I know his thinking. Um, uh, there's a moment right now uh, that they are, you know, you can see this with people around them. The Surkov piece that you mentioned, I think, is a really important uh, article that people should read. And I used to sit across from Mr. Surkov, like Mr. Ambassador Volker, and I know what a dead end that is. Um, uh, here's, you asked my worst case scenario, here's my worst case. That the president, President Trump, now thinks he is liberated after Mueller, and he's not yet, but he's feeling better about that. And maybe it, maybe it takes to get to the real worst case scenario, it means we have to go through uh, a re-election, uh, and President Trump's re-elected. Um, and what happens then? And you see this in other areas, and now I think you're beginning to see slight tea leaves of it if you look at Russia, Ukraine. He then says, I have an electoral mandate. I was vindicated, you know, whatever the words he uses. Um, and now it's time for me to push back on all these people that have been mentioned here and all this continuity in policy, which, again, I just want to underscore, I, I don't think he's ever uh, signed up to that policy ever. He didn't support javelins to Ukraine. He lamented sanctions. He doesn't like NATO. He's never said a word about uh, democracy and human rights uh, violations in, in uh, Russia. And he's barely uttered the word Ukraine. Uh, you, know, one, you know, he had his photo op. That was good with President Poroshenko. But, but from what I hear, he doesn't care a lot about Ukraine. Uh, and from what I hear, he likes the idea of spheres of influence, by the way. That just instinctually is something that appeals to him. So what I worry, the worst case scenario, is after re-election, he finally says, okay, finally, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. Uh, and this quid pro quo, you know, Venezuela for Ukraine, uh, that would be something I would be very concerned about. That's a worst case scenario with a low probability because there's a lot of uh, things that have to happen there. A big one being <laughs> Trump being re-elected, by the way. Uh, that's, uh, but that would be something I would be concerned about. Do my American colleagues want to jump in, or anybody jump in on that, or is that? So under this logic, if I may continue what you've just said, it would be the best policy for President-elect Zelensky to uh, support the Biden team. And, and no, <laughs> no, please, no, 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 no more no, foreign no, support for no, any no, candidate. No, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I would just say two, two, two things. So uh, I, I think it's very instructive. Folk, folks should look at, uh, there's reporting that uh, Montenegro just recently handed down indictments and sentences for those who were involved 
in a GRU-led coup d'etat that was attempted there in October of 2016. The State Department had put out a, uh, in Secretary Pompeo's name, a statement supporting Montenegro's uh, uh, indictments. Now they walked it back before it was issued. Uh, they walked back a statement criticizing the GRU. What does that tell you about where the State Department uh, in the Trump administration is at right now? That's, that's point number one. Point number two, your first assumption that Zelensky is weak, um, I don't know, let's see. You know, there, uh, th that seems to be the consensus view is that he's weak because he's a novice. But also, you know, we all expect him to have his fully fledged team, you know, right now. Well, let's give the man a little bit of time, I would say. You know, he, he's not going to be inaugurated until, well, we'll see, but perhaps June 3rd is, you know, the date is in flux. June 3rd is sort of the standard date that people are looking at. Give him, give him some time to appoint his team. He is, he's having conversations. I've heard from some people in, in Kyiv that, who have engaged him that, you know, he's thinking thoughtfully through the issues. Um, yes, he's, he's vulnerable, and I went through in my own presentation those vulnerabilities, but, you know, I wouldn't assume that, you know, everybody can just walk all over this guy from the get-go. He did win 73% of the vote, and he has a very strong pop popular mandate to govern. Great point. Sir, you've been very patient. Sorry. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Arznyuk. I'm an, an entrepreneur cross-border across Kiev, San Francisco. My question is uh, regarding a broader view uh, of what is happening in, in the world's history these days. So uh, it looks like the, the pendulum has swung from, from this kind of globalist uh, liberal agenda, which maybe presidency of Barack Obama was, was the pinnacle of that, towards more um, kind of nationalist agendas across the world. We're seeing that, uh, well, especially in kind of Western world. So my question is, wh what is your view of, of the next decade in that world? How far along that pendulum will swing? And what events would have to happen to change that, to, to swing it back? And then in the context of that, how should we be thinking in the United States and in Ukraine about the future and the actions we should take? And I guess uh, that anyone could answer, but I'd like Mr. Stephen Pfeiffer to start. Thank you. Yeah, good luck with that, Ambassador. Yeah, go, go for it. No, I, I mean, I think it's swinging in, a, in the wrong direction. I mean, look, no, look at what's happening here. Look what's happening in Hungary. Look what's happening in Poland. You know, look what's happening in Britain. Um, you know, the rise of nationalist parties across Europe. This is not a positive trend. Uh, and it can lead to some of the dark things that we thought Europe had moved past, uh, you know, in, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, now, it's also, I think, pretty clear that the liberal order, the national order as it was established, it's going to have to change to make some accommodations. Uh, but I think it, there's a lot of pieces that are really worth preserving. And one of the things I worry about with the current leadership in the White House here is that I don't think the president gets it. So I also want to encourage you to buy Frank Fukuyama's new book, okay, if I can advertise that to the world because he addresses that. And also go to our website at FSI. We have a project called Global Populisms where we dig deep into your question, okay, uh, and, and come to the next event we have. All right, we have time. I, I'm going to do a, a speed round because some people have been trying to get in. So ask really quick questions, and then everybody will get like 30 seconds to, 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 to answer one or none of the questions. Yes, ma'am. First uh, yeah. here, and then I thought I saw somebody over here. Uh, All right, this is the last question then. I'm sorry, everybody else <laughs> decided to, the, so, to move on. I was, I'm not sure how fast this can be, but I just wanted to ask, so as far as I understand, the Budapest uh, memorandum in 1994 was that Ukraine gave up <laughs> nuclear weapons. <laughs> well, as far as I understand, the deal was basically that Ukraine would give up its nuclear weapons in exchange for protection from the United States and Britain. Um, it, as an American, it kind of feels like we've not kept up with that, being that we kind of just left them to the wolves. Uh, what, what do I, I don't mind who responds to, what do you? Well, Ambassador Piper is very familiar with that uh, memorandum. <laughs> Maybe we should start with him and then Mike and then our right. Ukrainian colleagues. You're, ta you're referring to the 1994 Budapest Memorandum of Security Assurances to Ukraine. Uh, and sometimes in Ukraine, it's tra translated as the Budapest Memorandum of Security Guarantees. I personally, Strobe Talbot, we spent a lot of time with both Ukrainians and Russians on this. It had to be assurances. Guarantees to Americans means 
if you get into trouble, the 82nd Airborne is coming. And we told Ukrainian officials in 1994, and, and we understood, I mean, th this was a key piece for Ukraine. It was one of the things that Ukraine says, we need something like this to get rid of our nuclear weapons. Yeah. The US government had a very strong interest in getting rid of those nuclear weapons because the nuclear weapons were not tactical weapons. They were on intercontinental ballistic missiles and heavy bombers. They were designed and built to strike the United States. Uh, so we negotiated the provision on assurances, which we said, it doesn't mean military. It does mean that we're going to take an interest and we will care. Now, I think the Obama administration, when the Russians seized Crimea and illegally annexed it, responded. I think the Obama administration could have done two things. One, it should have explained its response in the context of the Budapest Memorandum. And basically saying, back in 1994, we made this commitment to Ukraine. We are now responding because Russia has violated it. And then I think there were certain things that the Obama administration could and should have done. Uh, one was javelins. Uh, I, I was part of a group that argued unsuccessfully in 2015 that the United States should begin to provide lethal military assistance of certain kinds to Ukraine. Uh, so you know, I, I think we sort of lived up to it. I think we should have done more. Uh, I also understand, because I get every time Budapest Memorandum comes up when I go back to Ukraine, which is every time I go to Ukraine, um, I also, though, try to remind my Ukrainian interlocutors, though, uh, had you kept the nuclear weapons, though, where would you be today? Because, I mean, look at North Korea. I'm not sure Ukraine would have been ostracized as much as North Korea, but I can guarantee you that had Ukraine in the 1990s decided to keep even some nuclear weapons, there would have been no distinctive partnership with NATO. There wouldn't have been in a, you know, the, you, Ukraine would not have been in the partnership for peace. There would be no relationship with the European Union. Uh, there would have been no strategic relationship with the United States, no Gore Kuchma Commission. Uh, there would have been every time Ukraine went to the IMF or the World Bank for a low interest loan, you would have probably had the American and the European executive directors voting against it. So there would have been real political and economic consequences. Now, I also can understand that if you're in Ukraine now, you're saying, well, maybe having a few nuclear weapons that might have kept the Russians out of Crimea, maybe that would have been worth it. Although I'm also not sure that having a few nuclear weapons would have kept the Russians out of Crimea. I mean, it might have been preceded by a strike on those facilities. So. You want to add anything? No, I would just say if I were an international lawyer, I would explain to you that assurances don't mean anything and therefore we don't know anything to Ukraine. But I'm not an international lawyer. And when I look at the situation, I think we do need to be more involved because what's happened with Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine is more damage to the NPT than probably any other event of the last 30, maybe 50 years. I mean, since the NPT has been around. So North Korea, Iran, all that other stuff. This is just hemorrhaging the whole NPT regime. And so, you know, among the various things Steve mentioned, you know, we could have put more lethal assistance in, you know, my boss, Joe Biden, was advocating for that in the last administration. But what can we do now? Well, first of all, we should get off the sidelines of the diplomatic process and get more involved in that. This Normandy format is obviously a kabuki theater dance that's not going anywhere. U.S. needs to be involved. Actually, President-elect Zelensky, one of his campaign uh, right. promises in terms of foreign policy was to have the U.S. involved in the process and to convince us to come in. That's something we should do, and we should apply more leverage. The leverage that we've applied on Moscow has been completely insignificant compared to what we could be doing. So, you know, I've made this argument before that we should look at financial blocking sanctions on Russian banks. Not all of them at once. We should proceed iteratively. But we, if we blocked all, what a blocking sanction is, it's a prohibition on all transactions to the U.S. financial market. If we, we've done that with Iran, by the way, in the past, and Iran's GDP uh, between 2012 and 2015 fell 9% annually as a result. If we did that with just a few Russian banks, we could decimate the Russian economy. Now, I don't think we should completely decimate the Russian economy because there's financial spillovers into Europe and, and we want to be able to work with Russia in the future. But let's have a little bit more skin in the game. What we've done so far is completely a drop in the bucket compared to what we could be doing. We have these debt and equity restrictions on financing for banks. Yes, they contribute to maybe a 1% of GDP lower than otherwise. But real 
sanctions would have a massive effect and get Putin to immediately notice. He might not be willing to solve the conflict in the Donbass or in Crimea. I'm not saying necessarily that we could do it, but we would at least have more leverage in, at play. Right now, we don't have any leverage. So I think we're over time, but Hannah, you, you've I traveled a long way, so get one more bite at the <laughs> apple. Yes, please. Thank you so much, because I think if, when I spoke to Mr. Tarasiuk, who used to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, so actually from Ukraine negotiating the Budapest Memorandum, so actually there could be different readings or different translation, but it's the Budapest Memorandum, it's about the trust. Trust that Ukraine really trusted the US and UK. And now you could say that this is assurances, guarantees, and others. But in 2014, we expected the sixth fleet of the United States to be present at the Black Sea as a guarantee or assurances of our territorial integrity and sovereignty. And now when the world is talking about INF Treaty and US is withdrawing, you know, uh, Russia is withdrawing, China uh, Minister of Defense recently made a statement that they have a right for armed race, uh, and we are talking about INF uh, treaty and how to bring uh, China to the table and others. I think such um, situation with Budapest Memorandum, it's, it, it's not inspirable for North Korea, for Iran and others. So actually, uh, if we are talking about the future in this very turbulent world with a new era of armed races, so the Budapest Memorandum is a bad case, actually. And you could say it's about assurances, guarantees, but it's about your responsibility, and it's about real trust. Uh, in otherwise, I could uh, say that, okay, let's finish. <laughs> so. So I want to I want to say two things in closing. Uh, actually, to our uh, Ukrainian entrepreneurial friend, bridging from Kiev to San Francisco. That's what you said, right? Um, so uh, what I would just say, putting on my professorial hat now, my social science hat, is uh, when you look at global trends and averages, remember there's a lot of noise going on in between, uh, and I think you saw a little of it here today. Uh, when I hear about America doing this, that, and the other, and they People, when I travel abroad, equate that with President Trump. Uh, I just want to remind you that we also have really professional people that served in our government. You just heard from two of them. Uh, by the way, we have a system of government, but that but doesn't mean you retire forever for either of these two gentlemen. Uh, and so just remember that these people are also part of this debate, and it's more complex than just Trump this, Trump that. Uh, and number two, because uh, I'm not going to get a ch the speak again, I just want to underscore we didn't have a populist nationalist elected in Ukraine. Uh, so yes, we love to talk about Viktor Orban. We love to talk about what's going on in Poland and Salvini in Italy. But look at what happened in Ukraine. It was not that. And in many ways, it was not that. And I don't know what the future holds, but I think Mike made a very important point. Uh, we're just at the beginning stages here. And, and yes, it could end in complete disaster, but already, Things that might have happened, given this global trends, right? Ukraine is cutting against the grain. Still populist. Not nationalist, but still populist. Why, the, you know, there's a fine line between populist and being democratic. I don't like this word. <laughs> Seriously, like what, uh, hold on, why, why, what's wrong with somebody wanting to win the majority of the election? That, that sounds to me as a small d democratic thing. Uh, we, we can't have the debate about populism right now with, with people telling me to cut off. Grab Frank Fukuyama to, to talk about that word. But remember that they're not all the same, and these trends are not all the same. And every time I spend time with Ukrainians, uh, uh, I always come out much more optimistic about the future of Ukraine than at the beginning of the conversation. And today has been no different. So thank you, guys. That was great. That was great. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Seriously.